when I uh, uh, found out that uh, Will Steger was going to be our speaker, uh, and I asked two geography uh, students uh, if they would be willing to host Will. And uh, one of them was uh, Amanda Varley, and I'd like Amanda to stand up. She's done a tremendous job. <clears throat> And the other is Caroline Rue, and if Caroline would stand up. <clears throat> and I said, you know, this, you know, Will is this famous Arctic and Antarctic explorer, and, uh, you know, he's just known world, worldwide for this, and things that he's done on, on wilderness survival and wilderness camping and all of his teaching. And I said, would you, you know, would you like to host him? And let me just give you a little of their uh, reaction to this. Amanda, <clears throat> oh my gosh. <laughs> I've admired Will since, he was, uh, since I was just a little kid in school. He did all these real cool expeditions oh, to the Arctic and to the Antarctic, you know, to, to try to understand what, what, was going, what was going on. Man, that guy, you know, he's really good. And guess what, Bob? My mom and me made mukluks with his wife. <laughs> you know, so I've got this personal connection, and I'd love to do this. Caroline says, oh, geez, he was at all these schools, you know, when I was in high school. He'd tell and he'd show all the kids about all this global warming and how it was melting the ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctica. And, and how it was affecting the polar bears and the Inuits and the Inuits' life. Uh, and, you know, he saw this with his own eyes. You know, he really got out there and, and observed it, you know. And, man, he is just, oh, jeez, wow. You know, he's really trying to help the world. Well, Amanda and Caroline, I can't say it any better. Here's Will Steger. Thanks, Robert. For the, I want to um, thank everybody for this evening, and particularly the Novell Conference Committee and, and uh, Tim, uh, Tim for the fine work and the faculty that put all this together, and Jeff from the Environmental Studies, and your faculty, and, and all the students, and um, all the work that put, the, put this 5,000 person event together. And it was a great two days for myself. I learned a lot myself, and I'm sure we all did. Um, I'm often asked, uh, who was my heroes? Who, who inspired me as a kid? Well, you know, I, I had fictitious uh, heroes like Huck Finn, of course, and that kind of what got me into adventure, I think, in second grade, or at least thinking about going down the Mississippi River. And uh, the explorers, a number of explorers really inspired me. Um, uh, Nansen, the Norwegian explorer, was a, a very good model for me for not only adventure, but a man that dedicated uh, his life to science. Ended up, um, uh, my age in his life, he, he, uh, he dedicated himself for humanitarian efforts after World War, II, after World War I, received a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, Amundsen also was uh, another hero that, to me, showed logistically how it's done properly with dogs and, and skis and organization and teamwork. And then, of course, Shackleton was a very good role model. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I was very aware of him in terms of leadership and what he was able to do. But... My real life um, hero is actually here, Jim Hansen. And um, I've studied weather all my life. Um, 1967, I taught grade school at junior high science about global warming. I was very aware of Jim's career, but particularly with Jim in the late 80s, put his career, put everything that he worked for in his life on the line that, and the courageous to tell the truth. Because it was not very popular 20 years ago. Uh, in 19, it all started, I think, the summer of 88 when we had that hot drought. Uh, that's when global warming got on the front page, at least in Washington, D.C., and Jim stood up and really got cut down um, from many different angles from that, but he, he survived that. And um, so I'm very thankful for Jim. I read all his papers, and, and this is my first time I've met Jim, and 
incredible man. I think we, we have a lot to thank Jim for. And what Jim predicted, um, I actually saw come true. The scientists said the, the seam would basically rip in global warming in the polar areas. The problem there is very few people have traveled in the polar areas. Some areas I've been in, nobody's ever seen. But I've seen it firsthand, and I have reference going back to 19, 1960, actually, 40 some years. And I've seen the entire change of the Arctic and the drastic changes that we've seen just in the last five years. And this is what I want to show you today. I want to really nail the uh, nail in the coffin here and show you, show you the reality of what, what's really happening. We, we really need to face the truth. Uh, two years ago, I gave this similar uh, toned down version of this and got in a lot of trouble for it, too. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but I kept giving it, and now it's okay, because you see everything I'm showing you, you've, you've read in the paper, you've seen in the Time magazine. It's, it's common knowledge. Uh, I want to just go a little bit back to my, myself, how I got started. Um, I was raised in Richfield, Minnesota. Um, born to parents that never camped out a day in their life, <laughs> except for my dad during World War II. There were nine kids in our family, and um, as a kid, I was given total freedom. In high school, I had no rules. The only rule was two rules, certain grade point average, and if I didn't get that, you know, I was in the house. And then if I got in trouble with the law, that was the end of the, the whole program. The other understanding was if I wanted to do something or any of my brothers and sisters, we were all different. We were all raised in diff different ways. We all followed our dreams. Uh, if you wanted to do something, you had to pay for it yourself. So I took a motorboat down the Mississippi River in 1960 when I was uh, 15. I actually started working on that project when I was 12 on an old motorboat, fixed it up and traded in and three upgrades in 1960 when I was 15. I took a loan actually from a bank for 1200 which was a lot of money. Went down the Mississippi River. Um, we got arrested in every southern town. They thought we stole the boat. <laughs> and uh, it was a very expensive trip for us. And we were really in debt when we came back. And it introduced me to the life of an explorer. And that was the last motorized adventure. Then I started climbing when I was 16. I'll go into some of my stories here um, in a couple minutes. But as a kid, I was very fortunate because I, I knew I had a very strong vision. I've always known the direction of my life and, and kind of seen things a little ahead of time for myself. And, uh, I wanted a life of adventure, and um, I loved the city and the many friendships that I had in the city, and I stayed in Minneapolis long enough to get my couple of degrees and three years of teaching experience. I felt before I dropped out of society, I needed to get these credentials together. But I always had a vocation for education. I had a deep concern since a child for the environment, for the innocence, the God's creations, and uh, so I always knew the direction I was going to go. I didn't see myself really as a classroom teacher. I knew I had to go through that avenue and that I would be working in the education profession. And I, I spent the three years in the trenches and then I left uh, for Ely, Minnesota. And I'll show you the pictures here, hopefully. Uh oh, there we go, whoops. There we are, good. Uh, this is climbing on the Lake Superior. I mentioned I, when I was 16 years old, nobody climbed or kayaked in Minnesota at that time. At least I, I never met anyone in the early 60s. I, I checked a book out of the Minneapolis Public Radio Library called uh, Mountaineering, Freedom of the Hills. And in that book, I learned all the moves, the blaze, bought a hemp rope from the local hardware store, Penn Avenue in Richfield, and then went to the North Shore, uh, Taylor's Falls, and learned the craft here by top rope climbing and uh, traverses and so forth like this. And um, and I'd also have to say, climbing, you, you really, sometimes you come this close to meeting your end. So I, I was humbled at a very young age, fortunately. Um, I did a lot of uh, rock and ice climb. Um, Sir Edmund Hillary, of course, in the 50s, that was, he was my hero. When he climbed Everest in 53, that was the image. I, I was very fortunate. I was just, just in New Zealand on last Saturday, met Sir Edmund Hillary. I get presented there to the New Zealand. And, Antarctic research and NSF there, and um, he's on his last legs. I, I don't think he's not going to be around long, but I had a chance to meet him. But it was this picture, a similar picture to this, inspired me. Um, I ended up in, when I was 19, I got in with an expedition of real experienced climbers, and I learned literally the ropes there. We did a first ascent um, on this mountain, 20,600. I uh, did a first ascent on this one up this ridge, 18,600, and we did a number of other first ascents. It was pretty incredible as a, a teenage kid to do that. And 
And, uh, but it was really the north. I started kayaking when I was 17. Um, I was lucky in uh, 1963, uh, inspired by a National Geographic article, uh, we shipped our kayaks to Juneau, Alaska, hitchhiked up the Prince Rupert, took the ferry to Juneau, and then we kayaked up the inside passage, uh, portaged over the White Pass route where the old-timers of 1898 did, got into the headwaters of the Yukon, and this area was unmapped at that time. The map was like white, and it said unmapped, it was just, you know, you wonder, you know, when you see a white, you think something's different, but it's the same old bugs and rapids and cold water. But it was, it was on that section that, though, I, did, I met some of these old-timers from the gold rush of 1898. It was an incredible experience. And I think they were relating to, to themselves being young going into the country like we were, because we really hated it. The bugs, uh, the rain, uh, we were always afraid of dying. And we'd warm up around their stoves, and they, they would say, mark my word, boys, you'll be back. And I mean, thought, no way. So we kayaked on into the Yukon, and one day we, were ground, or, or, uh, we hadn't seen anybody for a couple weeks. Uh, kayaks were grounded on sandbars, so we were trudging through the water, haul, hauling the canoes or the kayaks, bugs all over the place. And out of nowhere, this airplane swoops down and does a flight over like this. It was just like we were so homesick. It was a civilization. But the bottom of the, of the wings, it said shell oil. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the exploration of minerals. And, and this is before the big, big rush. And, so I was able to see that generation of 1898, the beginning of, of that perspective, of the beginning of the rush for minerals, the very beginning. And then I continued traveling about 10,000 miles. Um, each summer in, in high school, college, in the three years I taught, I did major expeditions. Um, always worked two or three jobs. I worked myself through college and high school. And this was a guy who graduated from the University of St. Thomas that talked him into a raft trip. So we hitchhiked as far north as we go. In Canada, we ran out of road. Then we built this log raft in a small little river, floated that down, connected into the McKinsey, and then went to the Arctic Ocean. The problem on the Arctic Ocean, there are no trees, but we used uh, this uh, yellow, small little yellow rife rafts to get over the mountains and then come back again. So we always got into Alaska, hitchhiked back, and enough time to start school, either teaching or... or or, um, or regular college or high school. Uh, I was inspired by the north. I ended up, this is Ely, Minnesota. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with the chain of the Great Lakes there. Um, I was very fortunate because in, in 19, uh, I had this idea of finding the perfect place to live, and I thought two, two lakes from the nearest road. So I went up for the first time in Ely and actually found what I was looking for. Um, and it was three miles, the nearest road is right here. And um, I was a sophomore in college at that time, and that, that's where I moved to. Um, after I taught school when I was 25, uh, I moved and, and made my life in the wilderness in 1970. Uh, this cabin I built, I didn't know anything about building, but you know, I saw cabins, I talked to the old timers, read a few books. Log cabin is reasonably simple to build, but I really wanted to do everything the, log, you know, the, the, the pioneer way. I was, I was inspired as a kid with Lincoln Logs and Pioneers, and, uh, and I was sort of reliving that vision, but I also wanted to live really simple. I, 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 uh, didn't want to really own much. Uh, I wanted a roof over my head. I wanted to raise my own food and cut ice for refrigeration. And um, so I built this cabin where I, where I still live today. I put a, ended up putting a road in about 12, 14 years ago. Uh, but still today, so I, I wouldn't have anything to do with power line where, where wind and solar. And I went many years without electricity. Uh, we heat with wood, haul water from the lake. Uh, very, very simple life. And uh, always a little help from your, your friends. When you're off the road, uh, you know, you have to carry everything, and there's trails. So this is the way we did things in the in early days. So I always had friends, and I uh, basically we no there was no uh, soil for gardens, so we cleared these containing walls and pumped mud to form these rich gardens. And in the 70s, we were really quite self-sufficient on food. And it's my parents here, and uh, but it was really dogs. Um, I when I first moved to Ely, I, I didn't know anything about Outward Bound. I never heard of it, and I heard of this Outward Bound school. So I hitchhiked out there just to check it out. And they were starting winter courses in 1970, so I was hired on the spot, and that was a paradigm in my life at that time, because it really put together my skills in outdoors along with my need to educate. And also, I was, for the first time, was with peers, men and women that climbed and kayaked, and it was an incredible thing. But that was actually the first, last job I've ever had. And I lasted there for two years, and mainly because I had different ideas. I thought the winter courses should be run with dogs and not hauling, and never being on a dog team before, but I thought dogs should be running. And, and I was getting tired that the cabin of hauling in all the supplies in the summer, so I quit. 
uh, charter, I leased out a te dog team of four dogs and started that way. And then I recruited my uh, students down here in the city. I would come down and lecture about the environment and living off the land and so forth. And actually, I met a number of people here from the early days. And started these, I started with a lynx track a school, a school with outdoor education. Uh, the dogs served a dual purpose. Uh, they were used to transportation. We hauled in, you know, for a couple of decades, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds of gear and sand and stuff into it. And then it also afforded me uh, with a way to live, make a livelihood. I wanted, I wanted to really, my goal was to have a livelihood uh, where I was totally self-sufficient, where I was doing what I wanted to do, uh, teaching and being out in the outdoors, which I really accomplished. In the late 70s, I had the pretty, uh, homestead and dogs and business pretty well together. And that's when I started uh, uh, traveling north. And this is uh, a couple of the courses that I ran here. Uh, outward bound, or pre, pre or after outward bound. And then uh, from 1979 then, I started branching out. I, I traveled about 20,000 miles uh, in the Canadian Arctic and Alaska at that time. Uh, pretty much unsupported. We lived off the land. We didn't have a radio. We were pretty much on our own. No one knew we were out there. I didn't do any press. Uh, I always like Jim Hansen, I think, and I are similar. Um, we're quiet people. Uh, we, we do this out of duty <laughs> out here sometimes, or sometimes to make a living. But, um, but we, were, we did expeditions of some of the greater days, uh, in a way, in my life, where we were really self-contained and uh, didn't have any pressure on us. But then I had this idea of do doing the North Pole, and that's when my life changed. And um, many of you know me through the North Pole expedition 21 years ago. And we, we did what most people said was impossible, doing the North Pole and support it. We organized that by selling posters and T-shirts and so forth and build a huge audience around that. And that then lived, uh, led to the Antarctic expedition. I, I want to just get into the front of my talk here. And I want to show you, first of all, uh, what an ex a, a major polar expedition is like. This was the International Trans-Antarctic Expedition 89-90, where we did the longest crossing of Antarctica. Um, international team, uh, six of us, uh, Victor Boyarski here, uh, glaciologist uh, from um, St. Petersburg, um, Antarctic Arctic Institute, and uh, Victor had about 12 years under his belt here in both polar areas. Chin Daho, another uh, world-renowned glaciologist, um, IPCC, has written some, many papers there. Daho, um, were, his career up, up to this point was in the Himalayas, and he was in charge of the Chinese base in Antarctica. So we have a great a scientific team. It's very difficult to do science when you're mobile like we're doing. A lot of people say they do science on a uh, expedition like this, but it's really kind of play science. But these guys did real science. I mean, that was two hours a day, real discipline. Um, my partner, Jean-Louis Atien, a French physician who I met on the way to the North Pole 21 years ago by one in a million chance and like energy attracts, uh, we came together and that's where we had the inspiration of doing the, the Antarctica. North Pole was nothing but a personal best for us, but we, we knew in 1986 um, when we met that the Antarctic Treaty was up for review in 1990, and the big issue there was what was called the Minerals Clause. And uh, behind closed doors in 86, there was a, pretty much a formal document called the Wellington Convention was drawn up to start the exploration for minerals, so, sort of like the shell oil flying over. And uh, no, one, no one really knew about it. John Lee and I knew because we'd studied it. And uh, I had a map of Antarctica and I went to his tent. I showed him the map, I, I told him, wanted to do this full route, so we decided we would, we would organize this international expedition and do it around the treaty, and that was the, the whole, whole program behind our, our endeavor here. Uh, Jeff Summers from the British Antarctic Survey. Jeff was in charge of uh, the dogs on the British bases back in the days before snowmobiles. Uh, one of the most experienced men I've ever met. Uh, he was familiar with the Antarctic uh, Peninsula, which was a very dangerous area, as we found out. Uh, Keizo Fanatsu from Japan. Keizo was also venture, uh, a venture, a world renowned dog driver, and, um, and then, of course, our dogs. We bred a special breed of dogs, 30 dogs, three teams of 10. Uh, these dogs, very thick fur. I think I have another picture here. No, very thick fur. Uh, their ideal temperature is 30, 40 below zero. They, they hate uh, anything above freezing uh, they don't like. In fact, they like zero Fahrenheit. Uh, the dogs have a tendency of heating up when you're running them on a clear day above zero. And uh, the other thing that they love are expeditions probably more than we do. The worst thing you get to do to a dog like this is leave them behind on an expedition. So they're there all the time. They have this incredible, uh, incredible animal. 
this is the road on Antarctica. Um, let me just show you, um, first of all, a little geography. This is uh, South America, Chile, and Argentina. And uh, this is the Antarctic Peninsula. Antarctica is actually divided into what we call the western and the eastern. The eastern part is the main part of the continent, very high plateau, 10,000 feet at an average uh, ice that goes down below sea level in places. Uh, the ice cores that Jim was talking about, you know, we go back 400,000, 700,000 years. This is where the main, main science, now, I was talking to the directors of National Science Foundation, there's a lot of really interesting coring operations going on in the central part of the plateau. This is a, the, the interior of the Antarctic Peninsula is a horrible place. Uh, no one has ever ventured uh, across it like this. And then we have the western Antarctica, this part. Western Antarctica is, mark my word, is the place you're going to have to watch because that's going to determine the future of our civilization and why we need to move, and I'll show you later on this, because Western Antarctica is actually, most of it's below sea level. It's just hinged on rock. And uh, if we destabilize the, car, uh, the, the, the uh, climate, which we've already done, uh, we ups we're, by upsetting the heat balance with a sea level rise and thawing weather, there's a possibility that that could slip into the ocean, which I'll talk to you about more, more in a little bit. This I, the route here was 3,731 miles across. And um, historically, this route here was um, Scott's route. Uh, there was a race to the pole in 1911, Scott and Amundsen. Scott was English, of course, five men. Uh, they made it to the pole. But let me go in this area first. This would be Amundsen. Amundsen did it from here. They did it with dogs, five people, Norwegians, brilliantly executed expedition. They laid out caches when they got into the Axel Heiberg here. They basically killed many of their dogs to leave it for dog food on the way back. Made a dash across the pole, came back with the dog food, the dead dogs, they ate the dogs, um, and came back um, in really good shape. Um, Scott, on the other hand, uh, made, made several uh, wrong decisions and uh, historically, modern history is real critical of Scott, which, um, um, and most of the people that are critical are people that read the books that have never been down there and basically don't know what they're talking about. Scott made one major error, and I always read the history books to find, you know, lessons. The big error he made is that he packed his kerosene tins in with the food and it leaked onto the food, and because of that, if you want to, you know, nitpick, that's why uh, the five men died on the way back. They did make it. Uh, they took care of each other. Uh, if you read, read Scott's journal, I would recommend reading uh, Scott's Last Expedition. It's an incredible book. Um, talk about courage and sharing and taking care of each other to the bitter end and under the worst imaginable conditions. Uh, this was Scott. Uh, prior to our expedition, uh, 13 people had entered into the interior. Only six went back. We also had... Um, um, Shackleton, we familiar with his trip, uh, the Endurance, he, he was going to cross Antarctica this way. Uh, the Endurance got into the uh, Wendell Sea, uh, got caught in the pack ice 30 miles from where they were going to make their base camp. Uh, the, the boat got caught and started drifting away, and eventually the boat was crushed. And the big story was how Shackleton led his man, did the, did the rescue to Elfin Island, and then made the, the famous boat crossing, uh, a real incredible journey like this, which a lot, a lot of these journals like uh, Nansen and uh, Shackleton and Mawson, it's almost providence the way uh, they, they survived. And then we decided to do the long route. I never debated with myself when I looked at this route, this was the route. But in order to do this, we had to have the Russian cooperation because this is the Russian sector of Antarctica, and this was during the Cold War in 86, so that was one of the, one of the challenges. We ended up getting the Russian help, uh, Chinese help. Uh, did a lot of diplomatic, the late 80s, uh, wonderful era, I think you remember when the Berlin Wall looked like we had world peace for about two years. But logistically here, to do this full crossing, we have to leave in midwinter. And uh, in order to get off the continent, off the plateau, before the second winter set in. And so we left on the Antarctic Peninsula. We um, traveled along the Larsen Ice Shelf. This is, I'm going to show you mainly about the Larsen here. And then we got up on the, onto the, the Antarctic Peninsula, the plateau there. There we had a 56-day storm that basically blew and let up a little bit, and just a horrible situation. Uh, we survived that. We got into the interior, uh, got back on sort of schedule, arrived in the North South Pole uh, de December 12th, 
and then made it across the area of accessibility. We were right in the highest part of the plateau, 11,000, when the winter came in again, uh, 60, 65 below, but we managed to get off right in the nick of time. And a major storm, 17 miles from the end, we, one of my team members got lost in the storm when he was feeding his dogs and almost lost him, but we ended up finding him the next day. And uh, so we had a happy ending. So I'm going to concentrate right here in the Antarctic Peninsula, an area called the Larsen Ice Shelf. Um, this is the Larsen, Minnesota here to show uh, the ice shelves. There's uh, Larsen A, uh, Larsen B, Larsen C right here. Uh, it's a mountain range across here. This is our route. It took us 31 days to go across uh, the Larsen A and B. And you almost have to travel day after day after day after day, skiing one foot at a time to get an understanding of the dimensions of the globe and the dimension of which things are changing so rapidly. This is on the Larson, uh, first day out. Uh, we traveled uh, three dog teams. Uh, always, I, I like a team of six because it's a perfect number. You have a lot of options. We, we have th always have three dog teams and three tent units. So each sled is totally self-contained for 10 dogs and two people. And that means food for dogs, people. And this is before the days of uh, GPS. So we had radios. So each tent had a radio, uh, tents, so fuel, and so forth. So if we lost one or even two, uh, sleds, we could still survive. Uh, we traveled on skis. We never rode. Very undesirable to road, ride because you would get cold instantly. Only thing that keeps you going is the movement. And then if you ride, if you did ride, you'd wear the dogs down. So the, the main concern always is keeping the dogs' energy going. That was all, you, all I ever thought about was the dogs and the dogs. Because if you lose the dog spirit, uh, not only you don't succeed on your trip, but in this trip, you, you know, you, don't, you probably wouldn't survive it. You probably can't see in the back, but there's a little bicycle wheel here that's attached to the sled. This is an odometer. It's called a sled wheel. And that gives us our straight line distances. And then we would have a compass. We would know the, the magnetic the variation of the compass. Uh, on the Larson, it was not, almost a no-brainer. If it was clear, we had mountains to navigate on. This was actually the first 300 miles mapped by the British. And... Um, but uh, so we had the, the uh, sled wheel for mainly on the, on the plateau, the other 3,400 miles. Uh, this is um, Larson A here. Um, Larson A basically disintegrated um, in uh, eight, uh, 1982, 19, 19, um, uh, 1995, 98, I think it was. And there's a uh, highlands here. This is, we had a number of mountain ranges. We did about 12 or 14 mountain ranges on our way across. Uh, very spectacular uh, ranges, and uh, if you have clear weather, this is probably the only range that we actually saw. Uh, avalanches on the side, and, uh, <clears throat> and all, you're always roped up. Crevasses are always the danger, especially dog sledding in a crevasse field is, is really uh, bad. We're, we're on skis, uh, roped up uh, in the ice fields. You only have crevasses when you're going up and down. Once we're on the main plateau, it's, it's quite safe. Um, this is the food caches uh, in the summer before, and you know even fickled weather, but not quite this bad. We set out our food caches by plane, Twin Otter, and uh, <clears throat> on paper it looked like it was going to be an easy expedition. On the way to the pole, we had, you know, nine—I think it was nine food caches. Every 250 miles, it would be like connect the dots. What we didn't uh, expect was the uh, the winter storms. No one had ever been up in the plateau and the peninsula in the wintertime. So because of the storms, we lost three caches, very fortunately every other cache, or else we wouldn't have survived. But this is how we were dressed. Uh, once we got up to high elevation, we had you know, routine uh, wind, wind chills, 80 below, were pretty normal. But you know, we were like space people. We were just basically covered up. We were also underneath the hole of the ozone uh, for oh, almost a couple of months that year. And the ozone, as long as you're covered up, you're fine. Um, Daho, the Chinese member, um, one day made a mistake. It was kind of a warmer day, and it wasn't blowing hard. He went, exposed his face, and his face actually fried. And uh, so you have to protect your skin. The dogs were okay. Dogs evolved in high latitudes. They were a northern breed of dog, a mix of uh, many breeds of north, northern dogs, including the wolf. Their eyes were adapted to the high ultraviolet, so they didn't have any trouble uh, with the dogs. But this would be a, like a normal, normal situation here. Th this is one of the dangers, the crevasses. Um, again, you can see why we put... Um, we didn't want to put all our eggs in one basket. There was another expedition, Mawson from Australia in 1913, something you, you, most of you are not familiar with, history books, and on the eastern Antarctica. And he had dog team, a, a team of two dog teams, three people. 
and they had almost all their food, all their supplies on the front sled, and the front sled, along with the dog driver, went into a deep crevasse. We just dis disappeared. They were gone. And here are these guys out in their underwear with no tent. And uh, on the way back, the other, um, other person died. Mawson, by a miracle, uh, survived it. But that was a good lesson always, to never put your eggs in one basket. Uh, then it was a storm. So we had a major, our first major storm on the Larson B ice shelf, uh, which was pretty mild. We were on sea level. It was you know 50, 60 mile an hour winds, 20 below, which was pretty mild compared to what we got at higher elevation. We had uh, some of the days that we couldn't travel. It was 100 miles an hour, you know, 50 below. But what happened on the trip is since we were running out of food, we would have to go travel in these storms. And um, like I mentioned, fortunately, every other food cache we missed. We'd hit the food cache that was missing, and then we'd have to make a quick decision. Do we look for this thing and run out of food? We always opted to go. We'd go on rations, and then luckily we hit um, the next one. So that's how we go. But, but it, gave it gave us a lot of empathy for Scott because we, we traveled in the same conditions that he did, and this is what motivated us because we were pinned down by a storm, and we, and we didn't know if the uh, cache would be up there in 50 miles or so. But it gave us a really good perspective of, of history. The mornings, uh, always digging out two feet of snow. You know, it's always an hour and a half of chores. The dogs are covered up by the blowing snow, and they're totally comfortable. They're bored, you know, just staying underneath the snow, waiting for the day to start. And they pop out. Usually, uh, the ones that are close to the tent or the stoves get uh, uh, sled or the tent are buried in bigger drifts. So we kind of locate them and then dig them out, and then they're ready to go. This is the uh, Larson B. These ice shelves, the scientists think that they were, you know, uh, laid down during the last ice age, maybe 8,000 years ago, and they, they vary from you know, 300, 200 to 600 to 700 feet thick, very thick ice. And when you're on them, it's just like land. It's like an ice cap. You can't tell the difference. And uh, so this is what, what the Larson B, a historical slide, because Larson B is not around anymore. This is the higher elevation here. And then I want to I get back to now showing you the eyewitness account. Again, this is the peninsula with the crevasses, uh, Larson A, Larson B. And this is a satellite photo that some of you probably have seen, January 31st, 2002. This is the peninsula again. Notice Larson B is gone. And actually, when that broke up, I was on a ship in the area, and these huge icebergs were floating out. This is a low-pressure area during their summertime, which is like these, this is December when I was down there. But these, ice, these big icebergs were so large, they kind of created their own high-pressure system. So in the fog, we would see like a, a, like a clearing light, and it was these huge areas like of ice that were floating off. That was the Larson A. Uh, this, this is the Larson B here. Um, the slides I'm going to show you is of, of that area here. It took us about 14 days to cross this, and this is uh, uh, a day before the collapse started. What happened again, the Antarctic Peninsula, it's like a a thumb and a hand. The Antarctic itself is really pretty protected. It creates its own weather system. But you have the thumb, which is the Antarctic Peninsula, that sticks away from that, that influence of Antarctica. And that's one of the fastest changing places on, on the Earth. In fact, uh, when I was researching the glaciers and stuff on this, in 1988, I was in uh, uh, Cambridge in England at the uh, British Antarctic Survey talking to two, two glaciologists. And uh, they were, I was a asking a million questions and they're about the glaciers and so forth. And then one of them closed the, closed the door and they literally looked over their heads and they made me promise not to tell anyone what, I was, what they were going to tell me. And they, were, they told me about rapid slippage that they were seeing in this area. And they said, this is global warming. Of course, you didn't say, Jim said global warming. And, but they, their science would be, their, their career everything would be cut off, and my promise not to tell anybody that. And that was when I was you know, privy of it. I mean, I knew about this 67. It was so obvious in science. You add carbon dioxide, the earth warms. Everybody, that never was disputed. Where is carbon dioxide coming from? Well, fossil fuels. Well, this is now in 88, this is 89 uh, when we cross it, but this is 2002. So the summer of 2002, tremendous amount of water on the ice, and when you add water on top of ice and it trickles through, structure of that ice changes, and that triggered a, a massive breakup of this thing, disintegration within a um, five-week period. Let me redo this for you. This is planetary. This is global warming. We know that. Now, Western Antarctica, 
I mentioned before, has these massive ice shelves that buttress against the continent itself. And the problem here is when they disintegrate, this one was floating in the ocean, so sea level rise is no problem. A couple problems. These glaciers here, the glacier that we traveled up on, Weyerhaeuser Glacier, was over 100 miles long. These are like massive, long, huge glaciers, a tremendous amount of ice. When the large ice shelf is there, it's like a cork in the bottle. The, the glaciers aren't going anywhere. You take away the ice shelf, the glaciers start surging into the ocean, and that's what's happening here. Another problem is this, when it was here, the Larsen was a large ice front, so in the warmer weather, it kept that ocean water in summertime away from the continent. Now that, that warmer air is right against the, right, right against the, uh, the continent itself, and that's causing uh, more problems. This is on the Greenland, Greenland ice cap. Um, we traveled um, across Greenland in 1988. It's a training for Antarctica. In fact, our success in Antarctica was because of this expedition. We traveled the long route south to north unsupported, about 1,600 miles. Uh, no one had ever ran dogs at 10,000 feet. We went, first of all, we had to find out uh, if dogs, you know, what, how we could factor our logistics, how much energy of the dogs so we could calculate that. And also, we had to prove to ourselves when we crossed the area of accessibility from the South Pole to Vostok, which was a, you know, a thousand miles or so, we needed to prove to ourselves that we could travel 1,600 miles you know, and get our own self out. Plus, we, we worked on diets and team, team building and so forth. So this is at 10,000 feet, the highest point of the Greenland ice cap. Uh, this is Greenland here. It's probably about 1,700 miles from north, south here to north. Uh, large ice cap, the, the height of land is right in here. Um, it contains, I believe, about 11, 12 percent of fresh water on the earth, of course, locked up in ice. And uh, if the Greenland ice cap would totally disintegrate, you know, the scientists are saying maybe a 22 foot rise in the sea level. It's, it's stable, I'm not saying the, the main ice cap, but there's problems. Uh, this is two, 1992. Uh, the red lines here is where you had the summer thaws. So this is actually a little bit of a warm year, but you can see the thaws are going up to, you know, 1,000 feet, maybe a little less. Not a major problem yet. Uh, this is 2002. Notice how that's getting higher. Now this is um, three years later, 2005. They'll be very curious to see what it's going to look like this year. But look at this again. You can envision as the warmer air in the summer in, in the Antarctica that's getting, in, in the Arctic, that's getting higher and higher. But we're not going to get a, a total meltdown. Jim talked about this today. But what happens is you get a massive runoff of water. And this wa water flows down through holes and crevasses. And you have the ice cap and glaciers. Of course, you have gravity involved. And you lubricate the bottom of the glacier. What happens on the edge? You have this type of thing. Southwestern Greenland, we, we read about this now in the paper, uh, the surging of the, of the glaciers there. And this is happening at a very rapid rate. It's that water. It's the water on it. So we're already seeing some real questionable places here in southwestern Greenland. This is um, <clears throat> top of the continent, the North Pole here. Um, the North Pole, this is the Arctic Ocean for a geography lesson here. Uh, the, uh, the Arctic Ocean is a deep ocean basin, like a cereal bowl. It drops down real deep. It's about average of 10,000 feet. It's almost uh, 15,000 feet at the, south, at the North Pole itself, covered by a thin layer of ice, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and about the size of the United States, the main body here. But what I'm showing here, here's Greenland, it's the ice cap, but this, red, this white area here is permafrost. And permafrost, if you ever walked in the tundra and the mountains or you know, above the tree line, permafrost is permanently frozen ground. Uh, you have lakes, of course, but a lot of it is frozen bog and swamp. In some areas, it's extremely deep. Now, as long as permafrost is frozen, it doesn't interact with the atmosphere. And I actually testified in the Senate in 1991 about the dangers of the permafrost thawing, releasing methane in the air. This is what permafrost looks like in the winter. You know, you really can't tell if you're in a lake or a swamp. It's pretty benign looking in the wintertime. Summertime, it's really beautiful flowers and so forth. This is Ellesmere Island, about 500 miles from the pole. I've dog packed a lot. That's one way of, when you run out of snow, you keep moving across mountains and so forth. But if you were to dig down where the dogs were, you'd go down about six inches of moss and, and humus, and you'd hit the solid ice. That's, that's permafrost. 
Um, this is the uh, permafrost area, the colored areas, um, the deeper area here in, in uh, Russia. About six million uh, square miles, if I have that figure right, of permafrost. This is as it is now, um, thawing on the edges. This is what's predicted uh, 50 years from now, business as usual. And then this would be totally a catastrophic event. 90% of it gone in 100 years. Even this would be beyond a world that we it would be hard to envision. But to visualize this, think of permanently frozen ground, and this, this state is not interacting. But what happens to, in this scenario, in the summertime, which is getting longer and longer? Well, once the fra it thaws, you start getting decaying, decomposition of organic materials, and that releases carbon dioxide and methane. Methane is extremely dangerous greenhouse gas, and this is this would be a major problem. This is happening. I mean, we, we've heard about the permafrost melting. Uh, if you were in Nome, Alaska 10 years ago and you said you didn't believe in global warming, they'd probably run you out of town. So in Alaska and areas on the fringe of the permafrost, like so many places in the Arctic, you know, it's been happening for quite a while. This is the top of the globe again. <clears throat> we talk about the Arctic Ocean here. Uh, the top of the, the Arctic Ocean is a um, thin layer of ice, uh, called pack ice. Uh, when we went to the North Pole 20 years ago, uh, 1986, 21, pretty much a normal year as it was 100 years ago when Perry did it. Uh, th at that time, the average thickness of the ice was around eight feet. It's now you know, under, under, way under six right now. Uh, but you have, in the, in the summertime, the winter, of course, this is all frozen, but in the summertime, uh, 20 years ago, and for the last 5,000 years, most of this has been pretty well frozen, little thawing on the fringes. And you have a real long uh, winter that breaks up May or June. So the top of the globe, top third of the globe, um, has been ice and snow in the summer, majority. And then when energy hits that, it reflects off. It's like wearing a white hat. You know, you don't get hot. But now what's happening with global warming, because 80% of this heat is going into the ocean, it's cumulative, it's been happening for a while, but now we're finally starting to see um, things happen. This is what the Arctic Ocean looks like from a resupply plane. Um, it's open, cracks, it's almost like a tectonic plates where it opens in some areas and it comes together forming pressure ridges. It's really a unique, challenging terrain to cross. I, you, I, as an explorer, I really fall in love with crossing it, although you know, those days are over. Um, this is what it's looking like now in the winter. It's opening up more and more. And within another 10 years, I do not think you'll be able to make it to the North Pole without flotation. I think those days of going over in the winter without flotation uh, is, is over. And this is the situation that we have here. Uh, normal sequence reflected, nine, about 99% of the energy goes back into outer space. And then this is, would be like the normal summer, a little bit of heat, but mostly reflecting. This is what we're doing now, the domino effect. If you get, once you get more energy in, you get more heat absorbing, more ice going. And this is happening extremely quickly now in the summer. This is the scenario that, the tipping point that I believe that we're heading for. And again, I testified in Congress in 91. I talked about the, losing the summer sea ice. That would be the point where everything would change really rapidly. And uh, this scenario here, uh, scientists are predicting that this will happen in 2030, and that's very soon. I actually think it's gonna, I, I'm a, I'm not, I don't have a career in science with funding, and uh, I'm able to take a little bit of a license, hedge the bet a little bit. But I would say it doesn't really matter because if it goes in 2030, it's, it's pretty serious. I think 2020. And, um, that will change the heat balance of the globe, which is already starting. Because when you have this reflective area, when that disappears, all that heat goes in. And already, everything kind of in concert. It's not like one thing after another. But other things are happening. These other positive feedbacks, water vapor, more water vapor, more, more methane. We're reducing our methane now. But the, the release of the methane of, of, of uh, permafrost is going to equal that and then suppress that. And then you're going to see, we're already starting to now see the sea level rise and that I believe will unhinge the ice shelves in western Antarctica, which will be, you know, another climate. And uh, this is in 1979. I was talking about the summertime. Uh, it's convenient with the summer scientists to measure the least amount of ice. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good parameter. That usually happens in September. This is 79 here. Kind of a normal year. You'd have a 
a little bit of opening. A lot of this would be loose pack ice, not totally open water as it shows. Uh, this is 2003. I don't, don't have a slide for 2007, but I think you've all, all read it. The, the, the level that we lost this year, this whole area here, is out of here this year. And this area was what was used to, was called multi-year ice. That's ice that stays one year after another, two or three years. And then what happens is there's a, there's a current, that trans, trans, uh, Arctic drift, transpolar drift that goes across, and that ice exits here. So your, your normal situation. But now, with the loss of this ice here, we're, we're losing the, the multi-year ice, which means this year it'll freeze to maybe six feet or thinner ice. Next year it'll break up faster. So this is, the, this is what's happening now uh, in the Arctic. It's, the Northwest Passage was o wide open. I think it is still wide open. First time in recorded history. And um, I traveled across the Northwest Passage uh, on, an, on a small boat, actually, in 2000. And, 60 feet or something, which was big to me, but not ice reinforced, but we crossed, we managed to get across it, but we were in Coronation Gulf here having gin and tonics at 70 below where, you know, Franklin died, and it was like everybody on, uh, that were on, was on that ship got the wake-up call, but this was a major wake-up call this year, and then um, the, our, our beloved bears are going to go. Um, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do for them. Uh, if I would have said that a year and a half ago, I would have gotten in real trouble, but you're reading about it. Um, what, what's really baffling to me is that um, I, I, I've been down, as many of you know, in the trenches here for the last two years, and um, I always go where there's the most resistance. And when we came down, we really needed to get the conservative support in the state. And I first approached it through economics, because this is a huge economic opportunity as we're infrastructure of energy changes, but also as a moral issue. And I show this slide and talk about the bears being gone and look out in an audience of 500 people and it's, it's amazing. But what, what, it, what it does to me is I wonder, where have we been for the last 20 years? We knew this. And all of a sudden it takes a polar bear sometimes to make a moral connection of our lifestyle affecting mass extinction. And uh, the bears are, not all going yet uh, on the fringes, southern Hudson Bay, or that population will go um, up in um, Spalbark, Spitsbergen. Um, it's interesting because I, um, I'm always watching ice and talking to people and gathering information from Inuit the scientists and wherever I can gleam it and read it. I have a number of Russian friends of mine that work the, the icebreakers on the Arctic Ocean. So each, at the end of the year, I ask them about details of what they're seeing. This year they saw a lot of bears, 17 bears in one area, bears at the pole. So as the ice is getting loose, the Arctic Ocean used to be solid. There's a, a good bear population there. Well, we were at last year, Baffin Island, the bear population is healthy. In the center, it's healthy. But as this gets warmer and warmer, especially when we lose the summer sea ice, because the bear, 95% of its bear, uh, bears died as seal. And the only way it can catch a seal is for that seal to be either sleeping on the ice in the summertime or in an ice hole, breathing through the ice hole in the wintertime. They can't swim after a seal. So when they lose the ice, uh, their, their history. Uh, this is the dilemma. This is the Time magazine of April of uh, 2005. This is actually was the, the opening salvo. Finally, the media came on board uh, with this Time magazine. It was safe, finally, to talk about the bears. And the Time magazine had the bear, the dilemma of the bear. This is the dilemma of our civilization, by the way. Um, Dead bears, you know, don't want to scare you, but I was on an expedition uh, with Russians, uh, Russian ship, uh, Spalbark in northeastern Greenland a year ago. In that area, the sea ice would be open normally two months, maybe three. A bear can last three months, but uh, last year it was like five months. And we found a number of these bears that were starved like this, a um, number of bears that were cannibalized. But it's not the bear is just starving to death. What happens when in an extinction situation uh, it's the birthing rates. The mother bear gives birth of two or three, and then without the food, it's one or it's none, and that's how the population uh, will eventually drop off. I just want to briefly show you what we did last year. Um, we are here. Uh, this is uh, uh, Baffin Island, a uh, large island, 1,400 miles across this way. This is, again, ground zero of global warming, not only because this is one of the fastest changes, changing places in the Arctic, but also it has an intact traditional knowledge that relies on the 
uh, wild, uh, their, their tradition for hunting. Up to 80% of their food comes off the land. So um, I do a lot of uh, policy work. Um, I've actually, actually been doing this for 20 years. Most people know me as an explorer. Uh, and I'm also a science background, but science only goes so far. I mean, I can see people's, I throw up a chart here, I, half your, or your eyes won't glaze over, but an average audience, you know, you can see, you can see them losing them. So I, we wanted to put a cultural face on global warming, so uh, we organized this expedition in Baffin. We traveled about 1,200, 1,400 miles, really rugged terrain here, and we got a real sense for ourselves. First thing, we had these three Inuit guys uh, mentioned before, 54 and 60, in their 60s, they were basically our eyes and ears because this was a new area to us, but they uh, were very familiar with the area because they, when, when you're an Inuit, uh, they're not of our culture. They don't understand materialism and the way we operate, uh, but they're extremely observant. But a lot of this knowledge has been passed on for centuries and centuries and centuries, and their whole life is animals, conditions, and so forth. So they were excellent you know, guides for us to show us um, uh, I, I was often asked, what, what was the, um, the big wake-up call here? The wake-up call that I saw was the Cumberland Sound. This area is, has always been frozen. Uh, actually, our route, this is our plan route, didn't go that way. Um, at the end of January, before we crossed the Cumberland, the entire sound broke up. And it was the, the Inuit that were living along the side, you know, described it. They said it wasn't the wind, it was a big swell. It was a huge, you know, super storm in North Atlantic, setting up a thing that just shattered the whole thing. And then when we came about, it was freezing up. We went around the edges here to Pangerton. Uh, the day after we arrived in the town, this whole area that we had just crossed went into the ocean. So that was a little bit of a wake-up call. I mean, that was, that's probably a global warming event. I question a lot of people. In 42, they had a, a similar breakup at one point. But going back as far, they, these people had lived there forever, you know, this... And again, it could be a freak weather event. You can't, you got to be very careful always of pinning a one event, the flood of Minnesota or this or that, global warming. These are climatic uh, you know, spot things. But you can add all this up, which is happening around the world that's predicted. All, all these extremes are part of the picture. So anyways, we crossed here, uh, the villages. Um, this is our team, the three Inuit guys here, uh, Theo, uh, Simon, Luki, and... Uh, Two of our women were the uh, education, uh, Elizabeth and Abby, my partner, John Stetson. There was one other educator, Nancy, was, took the picture here, our dogs. We had about 50 dogs. Uh, these guys, uh, Simon was 54, Luke is 67. He's the, one of the toughest guys I've ever seen. Dog, they, they were raised in that culture. And um, they can go without eating, without food. They're, they're lived by Glulik um, in an area where the traditional center of that culture is. Glulik is like Baffin Island on the North American continent. There's a straits there, uh, Fury and Hecla Straits. This area, there's a strong current that goes through there, but it's also the coldest place in the Arctic. And with the 50 below, freezes that, and there's plenty of game. So that civilization actually came out of that area because there was one area, because there was always walrus in that, the dogs evolved in that area. Other villages, the dogs would, you know, be good for four or five years of the starvation. But these guys were hunters on the moving ice, which is really tricky. And anyways, learned a lot. This is the way we traveled, four teams. Uh, uh, the last leg, Richard Branson, uh, son Sam, joined us. Um, and uh, this is uh, spring weather. Too. It's Arctic uh, polar areas are kind of night and day. That we, we left in the darkness, pretty much the darkness in early February, and then dark uh, light here. We've always done, uh, Abby and Elizabeth had the real hard jobs, the educators, because at 9 o'clock, you know, you can start in the evening, you start gearing down. That's when the education program starts. It takes two, three hours at least. The technology usually fails, and you've got to get up early in the morning. So they were really young and, and a lot of energy, and uh, we, we were able to transmit daily. Uh, we had a huge following like this. Um, I used to work with Gore in the late 80s, and um, El turned me on to the internet, the white papers he gave me in 1987, and, I, and uh, I read these papers and I, saw, I realized that the internet was going to change everything, as, and education, which it did, as we all know, but it was really a hard concept to get across. It took half an hour of business executives with lines to show how this whole thing would work. But I, I advanced warning, and I mentioned my career in education went classroom for experience, outdoor education. I didn't feel I was me meeting... Me really making a difference with 150 people, but the internet was, was it. 
And uh, so I, we've always used in the last 20 years our expeditions as a platform to draw in a large audience, young and, and uh, adult audience. And once you get, it's like a science model, once you get the curiosity, then you, we wove our environmental content. And it's getting more and more interactive. And, but this is the, 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 you know, the real program. We did a lot of work uh, in the communities. Uh, up there, they don't call it global warming. They call it global warming 101. So we did a good job branding ourselves. And Theo, my partner, uh, Theo was born in Igloo, almost done here, just a couple more slides. Kids are all always excited about you know, dogs and the whole thing. Um, I've been in traveling within this culture for 40 years along with the northern Indians. I've been in every single village um, the, in the western Arctic. I know four generations of people. So I'm very familiar uh, with, with this uh, culture and it's typical. I sometimes show up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden I'm there. But the advantage that we have arriving by dogs you know, these are very friendly people. They, op they totally take us in, open up, and they're willing to talk. So I'm always picking minds for information. So children, we're talking to the adult, the, the elders here, Theo and I, and we always do radio. They always listen to the radio in the evening, and this is Clyde River. We came and we had a three-hour radio show, and, and the guy that was running the station showed us a couple switches and then disappeared. So we had the whole, <laughs> whole thing to ourselves. Yeah, but we always had a lot of, a lot of really good discussions going, and... Um, and uh, we always work with the kids. Um, here we're showing them what dogs were, work was like. And uh, this, is the, this is the generation. Um, this is why we should be concerned, I think, about global warming. You know, I, my parents and my, my grandparents um, always watched out for this future. They always, it was a different culture, as we know. And somehow we slipped into this culture where it's fast profit tomorrow. We don't look ahead at all, but it's this, these children, I mean, I, I cannot tell you what, what's going to, what's installed for our children. The Inuit will probably be okay. Their entire culture is changing, but like they say, we are adaptable people and we'll adapt. And they'll ask me, how about your culture? Will you adapt when global warming comes south? I think that's the question we have to look at. Um, I'll, I'll talk at a personal level here. Um, what motivates me is the moral issue. I understand clearly, like Jim Hansen does, mass extinction, and I see very clearly where we're heading. And it took a while to catch this on, but in the churches and so forth, people started seeing the moral connection. That's spontaneous. Once you see the moral connection, your peace of mind is altered for a while at least, and you're forced into action because you've got to do something because uh, you can't stand by. And what it does, I think, and I see in many different ways the positive things, is it's really causing a lot of social engagement. Um, I'm from the 40s, 50s, 60s where society was engaged. People worked together. People volunteered for everything. It was a really incredible community that came out of World War II. But we lost that, as we know. But I'm seeing that the moral issue, global warming, is really forcing us into dialogue like we're having here. Um, I have an advantage because I'm all over the place and I, get, I see this and that and scientists and the average pre people from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. So it forces the, the social engagement, which is, a, which is spiritual, I think. I, th I think it's something very... And um, let's look at the culprit. Um, let me step, maybe get in trouble here. Materialism. Let's look at materialism. We all know it. We're, we've gone out of control here. We've gone outside of ourselves for, you know, where we look for our pleasure, where we look for our gods, where we look for our leadership. The materialistic habit is its just, I, I can't, that's, I, I try not to, you know, compare. And, and I, I live, when I moved to the wilderness, really, I, I could make comparisons, but I, I didn't do that. And I wanted to, Getting rid of materialism, or at least getting straight in your mind, is a huge relief. And as a young, I, I think because of my wilderness travel and, and you know, being humbled a little bit, um, I didn't want all that stuff. I didn't want to maintain it. I wanted my freedom. I didn't want a lot of stuff. I just needed what I wanted my food. I wanted to raise my food. I mean, I wanted to have hands on. I wanted to cut my ice for refrigeration. Um, I, I just did not want, want all that stuff. But you know, we are such a privileged society. We just don't, 
I'll go to New York to visit my brother tomorrow, or I'll go to the ball game in Dallas, Texas. These entitlements, uh, we just don't, we don't really understand, I don't think, what we're doing. And, but as, as consumers, we make choices. And when we make choices, that's where decisions are made. When we turn on a light switch, that's a decision. And we can do a lot of choices as a consumer. We first of all have to educate ourselves. We have to think smarter, which I think is a great thing. But we need to start changing. We, isn't that what we're going to go back to the cave and live underneath a candle? I mean, the life ahead of energy efficiency and the quality of life that we could have is really great. I mean, just something like a small thing, organic cottons. Well, you know, how many pairs of shoes do you have in your closet? How many, how many pairs of pants and all this stuff that racks of it you'd never even wear? Well, make a choice. Buy organic product. We're wealthy enough to afford that. And when you, when you buy, as an example, organic cottons, think of the poor person, the poor person on the end of the scale that's going to be affected by, by all this. Um, in a cotton factory and what they do with cotton if it's not organic and the dangers of that. But if it's organic, from A to B to consumer and recycling it, it's, it's a great thing. Also, as human beings, um, we're experts at denial. We deny our death. We deny, we deny global warming. We just we, we, we live in this bubble. And we have a real serious problem here. If I, if I had, you know, was relying on the stock market or relying on a job, I would be real uh, troubled here about the economy. You know, this economy of ours could melt down. We talked about many different scenarios. Okay, those are scenarios if we, if we keep going. I mean, America is in debt, national debt, personal debt, credit card debt, home debt. Um, we need like 3% growth to pay the debt. So energy prices, uh, finally we're saying it, supply of stripping demand, which is just the beginning. What happens? Energy prices up. And I would really be worried about inflation in this, in this model. You have the global warming issues. Uh, we're a civilization that has built an infrastructure on a stable climate which is now deteriorating. As an example, permafrost. In all the northern communities, it's all changing. Roads, power, uh, communities by the oceans that have to move back. That's expensive stuff. We, saw, we were humbled two years ago by Katrina. We forgot about that, of course. Right now, for most of us, we're going to see more of that. That's expensive stuff. We're losing small things like snowpack in the Rockies. Um, where do we get our irrigation? What does that do to our mass displacement, which is, is already happening? I haven't been down to Louisiana, but I've heard all about it. 100 miles, you know, economy ruined, people gone. Um, but let's look, let's look positive about this thing with solutions. Um, I'm, of the, I'm from the era where the Apollo project, when we were together as a uh, huge race to the moon. Um, we're in that situation right now, but the only problem is that the American spirit is docile and passive. It's not moving, but it's there, and we all want it, something. We all, we're, we're ready for it. We've heard in the last couple of days the technology, you know, it's all there. And, and we don't know exactly the direction. I mean, this is exciting stuff. It's like 1957, before the, before actually 57, a year ago tomorrow is when the Russians launched Sputnik, Sputnik 1. That changed it. We're in Sputnik 1. And this is the technological revolution is the greatest thing for our economy that's ever happened. But we need to move it really fast. You know, we look at 80% reductions by 2050. I think realistically it's got to be 2040. And that's a, big, that's a big mouthful to chew off. But it's really, it's right now. It's turning that big ship, that first 10 degrees, uh, getting over the lobbies, the skeptics, and everything that we've had to dig through here to finally get an honest discussion. We're there. And um, I sleep at night because I believe in the market. I know the market's going to drive this. I think it uh, it's, could be the greatest thing. I believe it's going to be the greatest thing for the Midwest. 
Uh, ethanol, corn ethanol, of course, we can debate that forever, but corn ethanol is a step, is a bridging technology. Corn ethanol is going to be a niche of 15% or whatever. Uh, there's, there's, it's almost reaching its limit right now, and you can blame the food prices on ethanol, but I look at the energy prices too when you're blaming, but, uh, but when we get into cellulosic ethanol, I mean, just think of the, and the great thing about biomass, you can't ship it to the coast. You've got to, you know, refine it right there, so that keeps the money. I think the big challenge for Minnesota is local ownership. We've got multinational corporations coming in, uh, buying up our ethanol and wind. And uh, when you own an ethanol, when a multinational corporation owns an ethanol plant, or a statistic, something like 10 or 15 cents a gallon goes back into the pocket of the local people, you're in the treadmill again. Like, like the, we love cor no, corporations. This country is based on corporations. My dad ran a small business. All his friends from World War II ran small corporations, took care of that. We're talking about multi-corporations, multinational corporations. And the challenge here is really low ownership. I don't think some of us in this room see it, but it's real important, the incentives and so forth. But I do see, I have faith in the human spirit. I, I've seen what the human spirit can do. Unbelievable. The human spirit can be in the most dire situation. It'll adapt. It'll flourish. It'll have fun. You know, and that happens. I have faith in that. Um, and I, I like situations that are do or die when either you get off your butt and do something or else you're going to go under. We're in that situation right now. I really believe this conference is really historical. It's historical for many ways. We, we, we've, we've had this discussion. It's historical because the Northwest Passage is wide open. I mean, it's too bad we couldn't have this discussion when, in 1988 when Jim t uh, told us that we need to, need to move. But we've had the discussion. We can't point fingers. We can't look back. Okay, we're in the present time. Can't blame the president. That, you know, negativity and anger. Channel that into good works. And, and, and let's stay together as a community and, and, uh, and, and solve this problem. But we're going to have to adapt. That's another thing. You know, but we, you know, we, I asked, I'll conclude this. I asked, the Inuit people, are you worried about global warming? They can't worry about something they can't change. I mean, we can change stuff. And the hopelessness scenario is the, is the big problem. But we, we have the ability here to really turn this around. And this is such an um, honor here. I can't tell you to, t to be invited to talk in front of everybody. It's just, I hope I didn't talk too long. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, um, do we want to do questions? Or, or I'm probably overboard here. I think we have time for a question. A couple of questions. I may have to have the questions relayed up since uh, um, the acoustics and that. Thanks. Thank you. Shoot up a couple of questions. Let me let me put in a plug here. Our website is globalwarming101.com. Globalwarming101.com. We're leaving on an expedition to northern Ellesmere Island, 1,400 miles by dog team. I've got a team of six 21 to 27 year olds from four countries. We're going up to survey the ice shelves that are left in northern Ellesmere Island. So if you want to follow along on that venture, see what's left because what's left may not be around long. We have. Uh, if you want to do action. Um, Go to our site. There's a lot of ways of connecting with other people. Uh, we have K-12 education. Uh, we're deal, dealing a lot now, set like 17 up to 27, 28 year olds, because I think they're going to be the movement here. That's going to that's the greatest political opportunity. Uh, if you want to donate to our nonprofit, it's hard to ask for money, but you can. There's a mechanism for that. We're we're always hand in mouth. Um, I don't wait for money to come in. I just do it and then um, you know get against the wall and make it all happen. So, uh, but. Maybe a couple questions here, and then we can go. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, geographic. Um, I've, I've been involved with geographic for 20 years, and again, I. 
kind of a geography. If I didn't major in geology, it would have been geography. But, but it always amazes me, though, that we're, we're a semi-enlightened group here, but most people don't know the difference between the North Pole and South Pole, and I think, you know, wow. So there's always, I always have this urge to, you know, to teach about geography, and uh, geographic has always been, you know, um, that's been their main mission. Geographic, though, has a challenge right now, like many, many organizations do, is they're, they're missing the, basically, like the 17 to 28, 29-year-olds, because they're not within that medium. They're, they're print, you know, radio, TV, and, uh, and the marketers are having a very hard time reaching, we call the emerging leaders generation. And uh, so we, we're working with them to make a conduit and also using that organization for geography, environment, and global warming to, to develop new, new avenues like uh, YouTube and so forth, this new type of medium that's ever-changing and, and uh, very connecting. One question. One more. Okay, thanks. Well, we've just about reached the end of the evening. And at the Nobel Conference, the tradition is, is that the president always sends us home and closes the conference. You know, I think about the only person that hasn't been thanked this evening is the president of the college. And And it, it's kind of a special evening because Jim is retiring. And this can't be your last Nobel conference. You have to come back. Okay. okay. But uh, every, this conference comes off because everybody in the community pitches in and really works very hard at it. And everybody contributes. But uh, presidents in particular get involved. Uh, they uh, are good at fundraising. They also sometimes have to answer the mail that isn't quite as complimentary. Uh, <laughs> and he's nice enough not to tell us about it, you know. <laughs> but uh, Jim has been amazingly supportive of the conference. He's a scientist himself, and he's very interested in the success of this conference and science. And so, President Peterson, please come and send us home here. Go home. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here. I hope that you have all had as good a time as I have here. And we'll go home with all the new information and perspective. And I, again, as I said earlier, hope to really, um, inspiration as well. Please drive carefully going home. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And come back again next year. <laughs>